This segment is brought to you by GoToAssist. So let me get this straight. The hash was here, <laughs> but then but then we're gonna put the hash over here, and it's gonna do the same thing here as it did over there. Is that yes. is that the it basically that's boiling down the concept? Yeah. And then that then the technique is called passing the hash. Correct. What does that mean to me? As it, so, say that um, uh, say I'm like totally old school, and I haven't woken up to the uh, the concept of it. And I'm like still like brute forcing the box's password or whatever. Like, why do I not need the password? Well, Windows authentication mechanisms by default and by design operate on hashes and not passwords. And, and so, from what we understand, hashes are more secure. You don't want the password, you want the password to be a hash, right? Correct. The problem is there was no salt introduced with the hash so that the hash and the authentication mechanisms that Microsoft use are password equivalents. Mm -hmm. So you, if you have the hash, you, you don't even reach. need the regular password because it plugs into the formula in the exact same way. So well, this is why you're able to use like a rainbow table to actually reverse the hash and recover what the password was out of that. But you're saying you don't even care what the password is. Who no. cares? You've get, the hash is the password. Correct. Uh, they're considered for NTLM, uh, authentication, uh, it's considered to be, uh, the, the password hash is considered to be equivalent to the password. And even actually using Kerberos, the password hash is the secret key that's exchanged between Active Directory mm -hmm. and the clients. Even though nobody has any practical exploits against it, that's still the way it's designed, so there's still even an attack vector with that. And even with Kerberos, though, does it not change every time they authenticate? No, it's the same hash that's used in the background. Nice. And so your tool, uh, or the tool that you collaborate with, mm -hmm. Pass the Hash, it just enables you to, what, capture the hash, uh, to use that? Like, you can't type the hash into the password prompt. That's not going to work. Well, for you some, need some of the, mechanism for to some log of the um, we're assuming the, the stuff that we do is assuming that you've already compromised the domain controller and you have the hashes. And so in our case, what you do is you actually do put the password in uh, as the hash for like Samba or Open Change or Firefox, you substitute the hash in as the password with the username, and on the back end, it does everything it needs to do to authenticate. So you didn't even have to think about what it's doing underlying. But what? Okay, so walk me through like the process as an attacker, and then how the tool uh, interpolates that and actually does the magic. Well, so. Um, when you log into Windows the first time, Windows uses what's called a single sign-on. So behind the scenes, you type in your password, you type in your username, hit enter. Windows stores your password hash in memory mm -hmm. and then passes that on your behalf the whole time. So when you log into Windows, Windows is actually passing the hash for you. So the hash that's on your local computer is the same hash that's on the domain controller on the exactly. network. Exactly. And so what's going through the network is that hash, right? Of course, it's it, going through the operations on the on the hash. So it doesn't actually. T it takes the hash and uses it in a cryptographic algorithm. Sure. Uh, based on the challenge that you get from the server, but if you have the hash and you have the challenge from the server, you can pretend to be you all day long without actually having to know the password. Because it's a symmetric key. It's exactly. Wow, that's fascinating. And so, is this for all versions of Windows? Uh, yeah, it's been this particular uh, attack has been around for 15 years, and it's still going. It's still going. I thought that was the whole point of like the the latest version of LM was that that was no longer the case because it used to be that the hash was so weak that it didn't even matter converting that hash into the the plain text equivalent was uh, it was weak sauce. It was like seven right. characters, all upper everything was converted to uppercase. Right, right. So it reduced the key space down, so it made it very easy to crack, especially nowadays. Um, with NT hashes, you have a character limit of like 128 characters, so you can actually have really long passwords. Yeah. But the problem is, once you hash it and have that hash, all of the operations don't operate on the password itself, it operates on the hash. That you and generate. how big is that hash? It's uh, 32 bytes. Okay, so it's, you take the password, you convert it to Unicode, then you uh, run it through MD4, and then that result is... Now that's your password. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's 16 bytes, it's 32 bytes, but you print it out in hex. 
So you're not brute forcing that. You're nope. just so. Uh, how do you go about capturing that hash to allow you to pass it? Is it something that you can sniff off the wire? Like, hey, I've got the challenge and the response. Um, no, the the hashes that are generated there, you can't pass in uh, the way that we're talking about. There is another attack that you can use with those called NTLM relaying, but that's uh, somebody else is doing a different talk on that. Um, you typically would get these hashes either from the uh, local system, you compromise a uh, workstation, mm -hmm. uh, you gain system level access on it. From there, you can, uh, you can use a tool like WCE, the Windows Credential Editor by Hernan Ochoa, to actually dump the hashes that are in memory. Mm -hmm. You can then take those hashes and use them against uh, the domain controller on the domain. You can also, uh, if you've compromised the domain controller, you can dump all the hashes through several different methods. Um, and once you have that list, you have usernames, you have hashes, you can do pretty much anything. So once I've compromised one host uh, and, and gotten that hash, I can then pivot around the network, finding other machines that that host is allowed to log into, and then hopefully do some privilege escalation and find my way through the network. Exactly. Just by keep passing again mm -hmm. and again and again. Yep. That is fantastic. And so how does your tool uh, make the back end stuff simple for the attacker? Um, really, like I, uh, like I said earlier, we, uh, we took command line tools that were already existing like Samba, uh, Open Change, Firefox, uh, obviously a GUI, but, um, and I just changed it so that when you, uh, if you have a hash and you have a username, instead of the actual user's password, it just texts to see if the hash or the password is of a particular length and of a particular format. If that's the case, use it in this way rather than actually uh, passing it like a password. So from the command line, you just specify all the same options you would do normally, only instead of an actual password, you use the hash. And then it just it understands, oh, it hey, this is a hash, it does the thing for yep. you, and then you connect to the you know, Samba share or whatever it may be. Exactly. And the Firefox thing, how does that work? Like, what's the attack um, vector there? Okay, so um, NTLM authentication is used oftentimes uh, for stuff like SharePoint or uh, Outlook Web Access. Is another o OWA, problem. for sure. I used to be an exchange admin, and yeah. Yeah. And so, then that's what they tell you, though, is Microsoft's like, don't use basic authentication. Right. Use, use NTLM. NTLM. Well, now they're saying use Kerberos, but most people, um, Kurt, you cannot use Kerberos if one end of the client is not, or one end of the connection is not in the domain. Mm. So if you're providing webmail access, chances are your home computer is not a member of your local that's, domain. That's the whole point of webmail access. That's the whole point of yes. webmail access. <laughs> And so, it's still the same access to the gal and everything else exactly. that's in the domain. So if you're using NTLM authentication, then uh, Firefox has an internal NTLM. By default, it tries to uh, use the native whatever OS you're using. It tries to use those mechanisms. But there's an internal implementation of NTLM that you can turn on. Hmm. So you go and you configure it to turn that on, and then you use the patched version that we that oh, we that's submitted. Awesome. See, I, I always assumed that uh, it was only IE that could do that. No, but that's great because Firefox. Firefox being cloud-based platform, nobody's going to you know use Wine to put IE on their their back. Well, the box. other problem the other problem with uh, Firefox is some stuff won't render properly, especially like OO likes to get real, doesn't like to show everything. But um, you, in that case, if you were attacking from a Windows platform, you can actually use WCE in combination with. Internet Explorer to do the same thing. Hmm. And so, um, w what's next for this project? Uh, there's, I want to do some cleanup on a few things. Um, probably the next big thing I talked about uh, here at uh, DerbyCon was being able to use NTLM past the hash with LDAP, um, which is what. That's like the open implementation of Active Directory. Exactly. Yeah. And I hate so, LDAP so much, man. Let me tell you. It's a it's a pain in the ass, but um, the uh, the open LDAP implementation doesn't cleanly implement what needs to be implemented in order to pass the hash with LDAP. It implements Kerberos and it implements basic authentication, but it doesn't implement the GSS Spegno, which is the negotiate. Oh, is this using GSS API? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Well, so now we finally have an example. So 
it doesn't by default use GSS Spegno, which is the negotiate that will say Kerberos or NTLM. Mm -hmm. It does basic or it does Kerberos. Would so you want to patch open LDAP to uh, NTLM? It's, it's one possibility. There's uh, some built-in functionality that I was able to play with in uh, Samba that they re-implemented some pieces of that to get around the problem with open LDAP not being able to do Spegno. So they kind of rolled their own version of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I made a few changes to that and that works, but I want to see if I can generalize that and make it more usable to open up all the functionality of LDAP because there's a lot of stuff that Active Directory uses LDAP on the back end to manage yeah. pretty much everything. So I want to try to open that up with either open LDAP or try to find a way to get that how would this tie into, say, a RADIUS server that's authenticating with um, Active Directory? Well, I'm thinking on the Wi-Fi side. So, typically what happens when you have some sort of a uh, extra factor of authentication, so like uh, smart cards or something like that, they, they authenticate with a RADIUS client. The RADIUS client does some mojo on the back end and then basically passes, when it authenticates with Kerberos, it passes the ticket back with the actual hash in it. But everything will still work if you have that hash. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Radius client um, depends on how it's implemented. To be honest, I haven't looked at it that much, but most of the time Radius is just a yes, no, like is this guy good, yes or no. It doesn't do a lot of weird stuff on the back end. So. I'd have to look at how Microsoft did their RADIUS implementation to see, but um, I'm not sure at this point. Yeah, I'm just thinking about WPA like enterprise. But I know like smart cards, for example, mm -hmm. if you have a smart card login, the hash, when you go and click the smart card login um, in Active Directory, it actually scrambles the hash, but that hash can still be used to gain access to all the resources just, on the network. Even the scrambled hash. Even the scrambled hash. So what's the point anymore? <laughs> Exactly. I love you, Microsoft. This is fascinating, Skip. Where can people come? Uh, do you have a website with documentation where people can dive in? Uh, yeah, I've got a, a blog. It's passing-the-hash.blogspot.com. And uh, my Twitter is at passing the hash, all bunched together. And the software, is that open source? Oh, yeah, it's all open source. All, all up on the GitHubs and the places yeah, where the software may be. If you go to, the, go to my, uh, my blog, I've got links to all the stuff. I think I've got it all hosted at Google Code. Nice. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. Uh -huh. Thanks. In IT, it's challenging enough when your team is working in the same office, let alone when you're supporting members remotely. And that's why you need GoToAssist by Citrix. You can take control of your entire IT world from one simple cloud-based platform. With GoToAssist, you can keep all of your systems up and running while keeping all of your users supported. Provide live or unattended support from anywhere, even from an iPad. And with GoToAssist monitoring, you get customizable dashboards displaying like performance of all of your networks, servers, desktops, plus proactive alerting that'll let you fix those little issues before they turn into that huge headache, making you look like a hero. I know I worked as a sysadmin for 10 years in the DC Beltway area, and 90% of the time I telecommuted from Williamsburg. Let me tell you, GoToAssist has saved my bacon on more than one occasion, and it just took minutes to set up. I remember actually ditching my old finicky solution soon after my first session. It just does the thing and gets out of the way so I can focus on doing my thing. So check it out today. I know you guys are going to love it. You can get yourself a special 30-day free trial. Just head over to gotoassist.com and click the Try It Free button and then use the promo code HAK5. That's gotoassist.com with promo code HAK5. That just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. But before we get going, it's time to say we're going to trivia. Trivia, Shannon, should the trivia. Yes, because he does have water in that cup. So last week's trivia question was, the first Intel Sandy Bridge chips used what socket? And the answer is the LGA1155, the 1155. This week's question is NVIDIA's, or NVIDIA, depending on how you decide to say it. SLI stands for Scalable Link Interface. It doesn't what mean were slide. the words? What? Doesn't mean sly. 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 Just, I'm, I'm mad. Just sly. 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 The Nvidia sly. 
So it stands for Scalable Link Interface. And what were the words that made up 3DFX's original SLI acronym? You can answer that over at hack5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 schwag. And hey, while you're over at Hack 5, go ahead and, you know, shoot us an email, feedback at hack5.org. Let us know what you think, what you want to see on the show. We would love to, uh, you know, take your thoughts and compile them and assimilate them like the Borg and make it awesome. Hmm, assimilation. Rawr. And don't forget, you can always follow everything that we do over at hack5.org slash follow. We got the links to all of the things, and you'll find links to our social networks and whatnot all over there. And if you love what we're doing and you want to support us directly, Shannon does an awesome job running the hack shop right here out of the Hack 5 studio, getting those awesome gadgets over to you, the pineapples, the duckies, in fact, a whole array of awesome Android hacking tools. I know that Shannon's really getting on an Android hacking kick here uh, oh, in the next few weeks. So yeah, yeah, check that over at hakshop.com. Super excited about those androids. And with all of that, we are at last reminding you to trust your technology. That's right, that's right, Paul. Sink that. <laughs> now I'm gonna pass this segment back to you in the studio. But not really. <laughs> <laughs> We're not recording, are we?